Okay, bless you brothers and sisters. What we'll be going into this evening uh, what we'll be going into this evening is showing proof that Christ is written of and was spoken of in the Old Testament. I'm saying this because uh, there is a lot of uh, confusion or misunderstandings on Christ in the New Testament. You have even Israelites who don't believe that Christ that came in the New Testament was the anointed Messiah. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take you through the Old Testament and link in with the New Testament to show you beyond any shadow of a doubt that Christ is in and was and is the Messiah, Yeshua, whom uh, this world, the European world, called Jesus. All right, his name is Yeshua, which means Savior. So what we'll do is we'll take you through the Bible to prove to you that some of these uh, claims that Christ in the New Testament is is not the true Christ, and that it's a figment of some sort of a uh, uh, pagan conspiracy you will have the scriptures to prove yourself now the majority of people that goes into this or believe these concepts are those that are against Christ the same as those Jews were against Christ in the you know in uh, about 2,000 years ago over 2,000 years ago all right uh, you have some brothers also out there that would teach uh, like an Egyptology they would like to just dismiss things that will that will bring you to their train of thought if they can discredit the Bible or say that Christ uh, don't exist or he wasn't written in the New Testament and Paul was a liar all these things cannot be proven they just regurgitating some of the information that that they have heard without any level of our uh, any level of research so what we'll do is we'll give you the information so that if anyone come to you with this, you can open up the Bible and say, well, who's this then? Well, who's that? And by doing this, you let the Most High be true in every man a liar. Now, I'll say this. Not everyone will receive the truth. Not everyone will receive the truth. You have to be willing to let the truth... Uh, uh, be revealed through the Most High and let it fall on whomever the Most High would like to receive the information. Uh, you can't uh, try to push it on someone or force them to see it. If someone don't believe something, they're going to find a reason not to believe. But you can have the facts so you can be fully persuaded in your own mind. You can have the information and that's the key here. All right. So I'm going to ask you again to stop the chat so that we can go into the class because I see the chats and it can be a little distracting while dealing with the class. All right. And we'll be glad to stay over about 15, 20 minutes max if you want your questions answered after the class is done. All right. So. Is Christ written of in the New Testament? Is Christ some figment of someone's imagination? like some some of these uh, Egyptologists or Israelites who don't want to receive the New Testament now here's the confusing part about the Israelites who reject Christ these actually believe that a Messiah will come they just in their mind cannot receive that the Messiah have come that the, uh, uh, that the Messiah was born in the earth and he will come back again they can't receive this. Even during crisis time. Excuse me. I don't want that thing dropping during this whole class. Okay. Even during crisis time when Christ was on the scene with the disciples. You had those who understood the Old Testament. Denying that he was the Messiah. So it's the same thing today. And some of the, some of the uh, Israelites rejected not just because they're ignorant of the the Bible they reject it because of the they know that the Christian Christ that's spoken of in the churches is pagan they know that that's not the true Christ so they use that 
as an escape to, to shun the New Testament. Let's go into it. Let's go to uh, Luke 24. Luke 24, and let's start at the 25th verse. St. Luke, chapter 24, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, all, the pro all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ have to have suffered these things, and enter into his glory? So Christ told them. They was coming against Christ, going against Christ, trying to destroy Christ, was saying all evil things against him. And Christ called them a fool. He said, you fools, here it is, you people are the people of the Old Testament. You are the scholars who know the Old Testament. But you don't know that in the Old Testament it speaks of a man coming to suffer for the people. You are actually executing the punishments that the Bible says would happen to the Messiah. So what did Christ do? Read it. Verse 27. And beginning at Moses. And, and beginning at the book of Moses, Christ did what? And all the prophets. And all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded to them what Christ did. He went into the whole Old Testament and showed them all the prophecies concerning him. Now this is paramount based on this discussion or this teaching because during Christ's time there was no such thing as a New Testament. So Christ was teaching out of the Old Testament. He was teaching himself about himself to the people to prove that he was the Messiah out of the Old Testament. The New Testament was not compiled to some 70 to, 70 to almost 70 years after Christ died and was resurrected so we know that Christ was teaching strictly out of the Old Testament all right so if Christ can prove himself out of the Old Testament starting from Genesis all the way to the book of Malachi so can his teachers the disciples was teaching the gospel strictly out of the Old Testament there was no such thing as a New Testament when the when the disciples were on the scene so you have to see that the same way Christ was rejected in the past, even while he walked, he's being rejected today. And they're trying to use this Old Testament against the New Testament thing as a case to claim that Christ is not the Messiah. Because they don't want to receive Christ. They'd rather reject Christ. And we're going to go into the reasons they would rather do that also. Read it again, the last part. Verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded to them all the things concerning himself. He took them into Moses' book, Genesis. And I'm going to take you in Genesis to give you a, a perfect example. The first five books of Moses to show you that Christ showed them that he was the Messiah. Now, not only this, the scribes and even some of the chief priests knew who he was, but still wanted him dead. They knew who he was and still wanted him dead. Let me get this for you. St. John 11. St. John 11. That's the one I want with Caiaphas. Read it. St. John, chapter 11, verse 47. St. John, 11 and 47. Read it. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. It says, What are we going to do about this guy? Because he does many miracles. Now they could have got down with Christ because he knew he was with truth. Or they could look for reasons to try to attack him and destroy him and to defame him. That's what they did. They started 
uh, 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 stirring up lynch mobs and getting together with people behind Christ's back to go against him. Read. Verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. He said if we don't do something about these guys, and this is the chief priests and private consuls. These are supposed to be priests of the Most High. They get together and say, if we let this guy alone, all people are going to stop following us and they're going to start following him. So they was more worried about their position and stature than the Most High. Some of these people read the scriptures that were in these high positions and knew that Christ was the Messiah. Read. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So here you have, you have these Jews who are afraid that if they stand and do the right things by Christ, that the Romans are going to take away their political positions. To show you the same thing today, you have politicians that are set up by the Romans or by the government to control the people. And the only thing they, they're concerned about is their position. Same thing back then. These were smart men. They knew that Christ didn't mean, these, mean anyone harm. They knew Christ wasn't a sorcerer. A lot of them knew that Christ was the son of the Most High. But they had a choice. They, 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 they would need to put down their life and follow him. Or he's a threat to their position because he came to take down all dominion. So they decided to side with the Romans. Read. Verse 49. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that, that same year, said unto them, Go ahead. Ye know nothing at all. So Caiaphas bust in there and said, Man, y'all don't know anything at all. Read. Verse 50. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. He said, Listen, it's expedient that one man shall die. So that the nation, which is the nation of Israel, do not perish. So Caiaphas came in there and said, listen, this is that one we've been looking for. This is that guy. You all in the council right now to kill this guy. And y'all don't even know. He said, y'all don't even perceive that in our scriptures it tell us that one man must die. So that the nation will not perish. So they, they actually had a hand in the conspiracy of killing Christ. Now they couldn't outright kill Christ. That's why they came to get him uh, in the thick of the night, early in the morning while no one was looking. They seen Christ the same, that, that same particular day during the daytime in the market. And they didn't say anything. Because if they do it in public, they were afraid the people would press against them. They were afraid because why? Wow, Christ was doing good. He wasn't harming anyone. He wasn't doing nothing to anyone. But yet they wanted to kill him. So what they did was, while Christ was away, while he was dealing with the Passover feast and getting that together, these guys was working adamantly and viciously to stir up the people, to start making accusations behind Christ and the disciples to stir up a frenzy so that it can seem as if the people didn't want to deal with Christ so that they can actually make a cry to the Roman government and say we need to get Christ out of the way so what they do they went behind Christ's back and started stirring up the people you see what he's doing I think he's doing sor sorcery then he, they had spies that were amongst the disciples that was coming back reporting lies and they were and this was stirring up the people right Read on. What, verse 51. Verse 51, go ahead. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua should die for the nation. And he prophesied that Yeshua should die for the nation. So they was told this before the decree was made to kill Christ. So these guys knew the scriptures. And, and I can bring it up to... Up, up until this day if Christ is, is not written up in the New Testament if Christ don't exist or if Christ was some figment of someone's imagination why is it so many scholars are going through so much to try to disprove his existence you would just discount him if he didn't exist but they know that he existed 
but they don't want to receive him today like they didn't receive him back then. Read. Verse 52. And not for that nation only. And not for that nation only, but for who? But that also he should gather together in one the children of the Most High that were scattered abroad. He knew about the other ten tribes that were scattered into other places. So this information we're teaching was being taught in the gospel and also the high priest understood that Christ had to come for the nation of Israel. Why? They were being dejected, trodden down, they were enslaved, the Romans had power over them. So, so those that were following the scriptures was looking for this savior because he was written in the Old Testament and I'm going to prove it. Read. Verse 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together to, forth to put him to death. From that day forth, they went behind their, their little meetings and in their little buildings, strategically orchestrating a coup to put Christ to death from that point. Now Christ did nothing to these guys at all. But they rejected him. So this is written of in the Old Testament. Let's, let's get a few that are written in the Old Testament to show you uh, the scriptures Christ went into to show them from Genesis uh, all the way up until Malachi. Let's go to Genesis, the, uh, the 49th chapter. Start at the 10th verse. Genesis chapter 49 verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Read it again. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter. A scepter is a staff of a ruler. A scepter shall not depart, read, from Judah. From Judah, because Judah was the king, they hold the scepter. Read. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Nor a lawgiver between his feet. Read. Until Shiloh come. Until Shiloh come. Shiloh means peaceable one. Or it's an epithet of the Messiah. Shiloh means peaceable one. What would this Messiah do? He would make peace between the Most High and his people. Read. And, an un and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now anyone that followed the Old Testament. Even Israelites that follow the Old Testament who don't believe in Christ. Can read this and know that there will be one. Whom all the people will be gathered to. If they read this scripture. So they would have to admit that there's. A man that would come into this earth. That would gather the children of Israel. From the four corners of the earth. They would need to admit this. So the question is. If they know it's written of in the Old Testament. Who is it? And why are they denying it's Christ? And this is what I do when I deal with them. I'll go into the Old Testament with them and then I'll ask them, who's this? When did this happen? Show me the scripture in which this was fulfilled. If Christ didn't fulfill it, who is it? And they'll just look at you and start talking. Yet they adamantly deny the New Testament. We're showing you who it is because you, you should want to accept him if he's written up in the Old Testament. But yet they deny it. And they won't show you who, who it is. Or they'll say, well, it might, it might have been one of the prophets or one. Listen, I don't want to hear what it might have been. Show me in the scriptures who this is in Genesis 49. They cannot go any place because it leads to one person. And I'm going to show it. Read. Verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine. And his ass's coat unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine. And his clothes and the blood of grapes. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes 
in the blood of grapes. Okay. You don't believe in the New Testament, you Israelites or you other people who want to claim that the New Testament is done away with. Who's this Messiah in the Old Testament? Who's this guy that will wash his, his clothes in blood? When did this happen? In blood of grapes. Give me the precepts in the Old Testament to prove who this is. And they, they'll look at you. But we can prove who this is. Hold that and let's see, let's see if we can prove who this is. Right? Let's see his visage. Read the 12th verse. Verse 12. His eyes shall be red with wine. They called Christ a wine bibber. His eyes shall be red with wine. Even in the in the uh, in Revelations one, it tell you he had red eyes, bloodshot eyes. Read. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And you shall have pearly white teeth like milk. So somebody tell me who this is. So I know who it is because I can go to Isaiah 63 to show you who he will try, who he will try under feet, trod under feet like grapes in a wine press, like it says in Genesis 49. It tell you that he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So let's see who this is. In Genesis 49. Go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 1. Now mind you, I'm in the Old Testament now. Okay, they say the New Testament is done away with or they don't follow the New Testament. If this is not Christ, someone tell me who is he? Read. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 1. Go ahead. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Who is this that cometh from Edom? Edom is the European powers that are set up, the kingships and the queenships in the earth today, the pure Idumean families. So someone is going to go through Edom. Read. With dyed garments from Basra. With dyed garments from Bozra. Now mind you, in Genesis 49 we're reading that he washed his garments in wine. And his clothes in the blood of grapes. Read. This that is glorious in his apparel. This that is glorious in his apparel. Follow me. Go ahead. Traveling in the, in the greatness of his strength. And traveling in the greatness of his strength. That shows us that someone is coming into the earth to judge these powers. Or judge Edom. Read. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Verse 2. Hold up. I that do what? I that speak in righteousness. I that speak in righteousness. Read. Mighty to save. Mighty to save. Savior is Yeshia. That's the Savior it's talking about here. Linking directly with Genesis 49. So what will he do? Read. Verse 2. Wherefore art thou read in thy apparel? So a question is being asked. Well, why are you red in your apparel? Why do you have on red apparel when you just had on a white garment? Read. And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. It looks like you have been treading grapes. The wine fat is where grapes are pressed. And if you press grapes, the juice of the grapes will splatter on your garment. That links to Genesis 49. Read. Verse 3. I have tried in the wine press alone. So Christ, it tell you that this Savior went through the wine press alone. He went through the mounts of Edom. Read. And of the people, there was none with me. He found out there was none of those of Edom, of the mount of Edom, with him. Not one. That's the Roman Empire. Those are the Romans, the Idumeans. Read. For I will tread them in my anger. And he will tread them in his anger. Read. And trample them in my fury. And will trample them in his fury. Read. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And their blood shall be sprinkled on his garments. So the Messiah is coming back to judge Edom. According to what I'm reading here. 
linking into Genesis 49. So I'm going to ask some of these Israelites out there that don't believe in the New Testament. Who's this? When did this happen in the Old Testament? When was it fulfilled? And I won't say that this was fulfilled in David because Isaiah came after King David. So don't try to go to the wars of David against Idumea. This is Isaiah talking future tense of a savior that would come and shred the Idumeans. When did this happen? And if this didn't happen yet, when will it happen and who will do it? That's a question out there for you. And if you don't have the New Testament, you cannot get that answer. All right? Because you would need to go to the New Testament to, 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 to actually get the scripture that shows this being fulfilled when someone is coming out of the sky to bring forth this judgment. How do we prove this? Let's go to Revelations 19 and 11. Revelations 19 and 11. Read it. Revelations chapter 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Was called faithful and true. Shiloh, the peaceable one. Genesis 49. Read. And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. In what? And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. So he will judge and make war in righteousness. So he's coming back for war. Read. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Hold up. His eyes shall be red with wine. You see how these precepts link in? Read. And on his head were many crowns. Many crowns because he will take all the rulership positions from the Idumeans, which are the Caucasoid powers in power today. Read. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Go ahead. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His vesture was dipped in what? In blood. His vesture was dipped in blood blood. Now I'm going to read Genesis 49 again. Binding the fowl unto the vine, and his ass coat unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Someone tell me who this is. That's the Lion of Judah. That's the Messiah. That's Yeshia. Read. And his name is called the word of the Most High. His name is called the what? And his name is called the word of the Most High. And his name is called the, the word of the Most High. The word. The word. Okay. Now that's. Now to tell you that he's coming back with a name that no man knoweth. He will get that name before he break the atmosphere. But he's also the word of the Most High. Now. Let's get more. Christ said, you, fool, you fools of heart, not to believe what was written in Moses and the prophets. And then he went into the Old Testament and started teaching himself out of the Old Testament. And that's what we're doing. You don't need the, you don't need the New Testament to teach Christ because there was no such thing as a New Testament when Christ was walking the earth. It's that simple. But... You must believe in Christ through the volume of the book. You don't need the New Testament to believe in Christ. Christ's whole life is in the Old Testament. The people that followed Christ and was baptized under Christ did it strictly out of the books of Moses and the books of the prophets like I'm going through right now. Let's get more. Let's get Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18 and let's start at 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. Go ahead. The Most High thy power will raise up a prophet 
excuse me, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. So this prophet that it's talking about in Deuteronomy is a prophet like unto Moses. Now, when you speak to some of these Israelites and ask them, well, who is this prophet I'm reading of in Deuteronomy 18? Instead of them accepting that it could be the Messiah whom this world called Jesus, whose true name is Yeshua, they would say something like, well, this is talking about him raising up Joshua. Oh, interesting. Joshua, huh? Let's read that again. Verse 15. The Most High thy power will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. So he would be like unto Moses. So someone need to let us know uh, what laws was given from the Most High through Joshua to give the people. Because that's what Moses did. Moses brought forth law and gave it to the people. Now the only law Joshua taught was a law that was delivered to him through Moses. The other thing. Now that I'm looking at this here. He would be like unto his brethren. So we would need to compare Moses' life. When Moses was born. There was a decree for his life. In order for him to survive this onslaught by the Egyptians, his mother had to put him in a little basket and float him into water, on the, on the water, to be saved in refuge by the Egyptians. So in actuality, Moses had to flee the tyranny of Egypt by going into Egypt and being raised by the Egyptians until the Most High called him out to save his people. When Christ was born, or Yeshua was born, there was a decree from Herod to kill all children two years back because he was tricked by the, the wise men who were told not to bring the child to Herod because Herod wanted him dead. So in order for Christ, or whom you call Jesus, or his real name, Yeshua, to survive, he had to be taken into Egypt by his mother and father until Herod died. And then he was called out of Egypt until the decree came in which he would actually deliver the message the Most High had for his people. Now what other prophet had to flee into Egypt for survival at birth. Name it. Can't name it, can you? So when we go here in Deuteronomy, our question is, if you don't believe this is Christ, you tell me who is this, who is this prophet? Read on. Verse 16. Deuteronomy 18 and 16, go. According to all that thou desirest of the Most High, thy power and horror, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Most, the Most High my power, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Most High said unto me, they, will, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. I will raise them up a prophet amongst their brethren. Listen to this clearly. Go ahead. Like unto thee. Like unto who? Like unto thee. Like unto Moses. Read. So this also take those who say this is Muhammad out of the picture. Because Muhammad came from the seed of Koresh through Ishmael. He's not amongst the brethren of the children of Israel. Read. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will put his words in his mouth. Read. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And he shall speak all that I shall command him. And when you read Matthew the 5th chapter, this is being fulfilled. Matthew the 5th chapter have Christ bringing forth the spiritual law. And the understanding of the spiritual law. On the other side of what was given to Moses. Christ didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. 
Now, if this is not Christ, you need to show us in the Old Testament when this was fulfilled. You can't. So that's, that's the importance of the New Testament. You need the New Testament to see what was fulfilled from the Old Testament. Okay? Read it on. Check this out. Verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words. So if you don't hear this prophet... So suppose you're rejecting this, this prophet ignorantly because you just want to reject Christ. Suppose Christ is the Messiah and you're not listening to his words. Read. Which he shall speak in my name. I will require it of him. But the, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods. The name of other gods. And this is what these guys are doing. They're, they're moving you away from Christ, going into all these other religions and, and Egyptology and all these other things. That's their point. They want to steer you out of the Bible or away from Christ to steer you into all these pagan and ritualistic gods. Read. Even that prophet shall die. That's crystal clear. So it behooves us to follow the prophet that Christ that, that the most I set up the Messiah now there's more how do we know that Deuteronomy 18 is talking about Christ go to St. John 1 and 45 St. John 1 and 45 go ahead St. John Chapter 1, verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. So Philip findeth Nathanael and say, Listen, I think we found the God that the prophets were talking about. Now mind you, at this time there was no such thing as a New Testament. Go ahead. We have foundeth him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Yeshia of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Yeshia of Nazareth. Why? Because the Israelites was looking for this Savior, knowing the, the Old Testament. So they was looking for this guy. Like, where is he? So once they seen the power of Christ, they realized this is the one we've been waiting for. You had those who respected his power and followed him. And you had those who rejected him for whatever reason. Okay, and we say this today for you brothers and sisters who, who, who stand for truth and bring forth the knowledge. People are going to deny Christ and the truth. There's no need to get frustrated because people denied and killed him while he was here. So if they didn't follow him when he was living, what makes you think they're going to follow him now? So we can't get all, you know, riled up if someone chooses not to follow truth. Read on. We have found of him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Yeshia of Nazareth. So here it is, Philip and Nathaniel did not need the New Testament to know that Christ was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Because there was no New Testament. So we can teach Christ all day long out of the Old Testament. It's, easy, it's simple. By process of eliminations, only one man did what he did in the earth. And you cannot point none of these prophecies to any other man. Now, I have more. Let's go to Isaiah 7. Let's go to Isaiah 7. Someone tell me who this is. Read it. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Most High himself shall give you a sign. Therefore the Most High himself shall give you a sign. Now if you are a person that's following the Old Testament. Then you have to tell us who this is. You have to let us know when this sign was fulfilled. What's the sign? 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his, na his name Emmanuel. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, someone give me the prophecy, if you don't believe the New Testament, of when this was fulfilled. Now, one thing I like about this scripture, I go here every time an Israelite deny Christ and say that the New Testament is not valid. You should see them scramble when you pull this scripture out. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play on your side for a minute. If this is not Christ, who is it? When did this happen? Now, because I pulled this scripture out, I need to bring some understanding out on it also. Because I know that some people are in their mind are thinking, okay, virgin birth. It clicked right on you. Now, so you've seen it. Virgin birth. The sign was not the virgin birth. That wasn't the sign. Let me show you what the sign was so that you don't go out of whack and start going into the virgin birth. Let me show you what the sign was. Hold that and get Genesis 1 and 14. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Get Genesis 1 and 14 and hold Matthew 2, mm -hmm. the second chapter. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Go ahead. And the Most High said, let there be light in the firmament of heaven. And the Most High said, Let there be light in the firmament of heaven. Go ahead. To divide the day from the night. To divide the day from the night. Read. And let there be, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days. So the Most High put stars in the sky, which is the lights, for signs. For what? For signs and for seasons. And for days and years. So the Most High put them up for signs. So when you look in Isaiah 7 and 14 and it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. When did we receive that sign? Some people look at, well, the virgin birth was the sign that he was the one. It's not saying that. Let's go to Matthew 2, 1 and 2 and show you what the sign is. Read. St. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Now when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. For we shall, because we have seen his star in the east. That was the sign of the child. The star that was put up for a sign, like you see in Genesis, the first chapter. So that's the sign, not a birth without a father. You follow me here? Let's go back to Isaiah 7. So they seen the sign. They was looking for the star that would give them the sign in the heavens that this child had been born in the earth. So I need someone to tell us who's this guy? If you don't believe in Christ. And I'm talking about you people that believe in the Old Testament. They skip right over Isaiah 7. Now. When it says. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive. I need you to look at that word. Virgin. The word virgin is Alma. In the Hebrew it's 5959. 59. And it means damsel or maid. Okay. Virg the word virgin is not even a Hebrew word. It comes from Virgo. It comes from uh, the Romans. All right. The word in Hebrew is Alma, which means damsel or maid. See, they give you that word virgin so that they can give you their spin that it means someone that never had sex when it have nothing to do with that. When you look at your Bible dictionary, it tell you a woman of marriageable age, whether she had sex or not, married or unmarried. If she's at an age in which she can have children, she's automatically called a maiden. Okay, it have nothing to do with whether or not she had intercourse. Okay? So it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Read. 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we know in the New Testament, in Matthew 1 and 21, it says, Thou shalt call his name Yeshua, or Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The reason it says Emmanuel is that Emmanuel means God is with us. Let me give you the Greek word. I mean the Hebrew word for the lexicon in your Strong's Concordance, 6005. Emmanuel, or Amla wa Allah. It says, with us. God. A name of Isaiah's son. Okay? So Isaiah's son was also named Amla wa Allah, which means God is with us. So it was denoting the fact that this son would be part was part of the original Godhead from the beginning. The first begotten of the Father. So before any spirits were made in the earth, this one spirit was created. It's the Godhead. The Most High took one part of the original Godhead, went into Mary, brought forth a son. The physical attributes came from Joseph. The spiritual attributes from his father on high. It's that simple. Now, for those who don't believe that Christ is whom Isaiah 7 is speaking of, I need you to tell us who is this? Who was his mother? Who was his father? Bring it. And see, this is what you can do. If y'all stay in these scriptures and show them this, they can't deny even if they deny it with you, when they, you know, when they get amongst themselves, they know. When they reason, they'll start going through these scriptures. Because I've had people who especially went against Christ in the New Testament, who was learning from people that were rejecting Christ. And once I just stayed in the Old Testament with them and showing them how it was fulfilled in the New Testament, eventually they came around and started following Christ. I've seen it myself. I'm talking about people that used to go at, go at us tough and used to try to come at us and try to really tear us down but they couldn't escape their conscience none of us can okay so let's go to Ezekiel now notice I'm in the Old Testament and showing you how things are fulfilled in the New Testament Matthew 5 and 17 says, Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to fulfill. He's fulfilling what was written of him in the Old Testament. That's what that means. Ezekiel 37, let's start at the 21st verse. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 21. Go ahead. And say unto them, Thus saith the Most High Power, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And one king shall be king to them all. So I'm pulling this out, um, out of the scriptures, because even if you believe in the Old Testament, and just the Old Testament alone, you know that there's one king that will be over Israel. The question is, why can't they accept that that king is Christ? That's the problem. They know, according to their doctrine, that one king. Now, I'm going to show you the high spiritual evil of doctrine when you, when you deny Christ. As we speak over in Jerusalem right now, they're setting up a Judaic Messiah because even in Judaism they teach a Messiah is written of in the Old Testament they rather you wait on a Antichrist Messiah than for you to believe that Christ is the Messiah now here's the trick if you don't believe that Christ is the Messiah by default you will be led by an Antichrist Messiah by default, because that's who you're waiting for. You're denying the true one, 
and you're waiting for a Messiah you can't even prove exists out of Scripture. So you'll be safe to follow the Messiah that's written of in the Scripture. You'll be safe to follow the Messiah that's written of in the same book. Okay? Because you cannot prove that it's anyone else besides Christ. I've been waiting for years for those who denied Christ in the, in the Old Testament. I've been waiting for years for them, for them to show us who, who are these, who is this man the Bible is speaking of in the Old Testament. And they, and, and, and they back up every time you bring it out. Who is he then? I'll play this with you. If you, don't, you, you okay, you're saying he's not Christ? Okay, I'm open. Who is he? Who is he? Or you just want to adamantly deny Christ purposely for no reason. Why? What did Christ do to any of us that we should reject him? What did this guy do so bad? But lay down his life for his nation. Died for his nation. Gave up his own life so that we can have life. But yet, we can't stand him. I hear people out there disrespecting him. Cursing him. All types of things. As if Christ did something wrong to them. But it's not them, it's the spirit in them that they know, that that spirit in them knows that Christ is going to cast them into the lake of fire. It's that spirit that can't stand Christ. So they deny him. It's a spirit. Because when you read Christ's story, there's nothing he, he have done to any man or woman that would make you reject him. We are fallible. Huh? David Koresh. Okay. Okay, one moment. I'll straighten that out. One second. Okay, he's out. Okay, good. So what have he done that people would reject him? Read on. What verse you left off at? Uh, 22. Read it. And they shall be no more two nations. And they shall be no more two nations. So Israel was once one nation before the sin of Solomon, uh, which led to the, the split of the northern and southern kingdom. That began the, the dispersion. In 721, the northern kingdom was taken out of the land. They were dispersed in Assyria in different areas that a remnant of them are there today. And the majority of them went over the waters into the new world. That began the dispersion, the sin of Solomon. Read. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And no more will God's people be divided into two kingdoms. And see, this is another thing that's getting on our that gets on our nerves sometimes. You have Israelites that have made being an Israel a, a Israelite a black thing. They're just defending any Israelite that went over, you know, that that was in a transatlantic slave trade. So if you wasn't in a slave ship, then you are rejected and they try to curse you out and all that because you didn't go into a slave ship. Their ignorance will not allow them to see that the northern kingdom was taken out. And in Edris, it tell you they went over the waters. They didn't come over in cargo slave ships. So they didn't fulfill that prophecy, but yet they will reject the, the Mexicans and the Indians and and, 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 and the, uh, the Puerto Ricans and all the other tribes that are just as important as those that went in the cargo slave ships. These same Israelites, I'm going to tell you, a lot of Israelites that reject Christ, they also don't believe that the, the northern tribes are God's people. They just concentrate on the slavery. That's all they can get. get it. Maybe, maybe that's all the information they know on the prophecies when it comes to Christ's prophecies. They so pigeonholed into the slave trade. That's all they can teach. The kingdom was split. Christ came like we read earlier or the Messiah came so that now that kingdom can start unifying. Not saying that, well, this tribe is better than this tribe and this kingdom is better than this kingdom. 
You have some people that will reject our teachings because they upset because we don't just teach black people. How ignorant can we be? The Lord says, go out and teach all nations. Baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How can that be wrong teaching truth? I'm, we're not denying our people anything if we teach truth. They can get the same truth as everyone else. What are we denying our people? Straight ignorance. Read. Verse 23. Go ahead. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols. And no more when we're set up as a kingdom again will we defile ourselves with idols. Read. Nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places. He will do what? But I will save them out of all their dwelling places. The Bible says he will save us out of all our dwelling places. And I know right there somebody is popping up and saying, well, okay. I dwell in America. He's going to save us out of America. Yes, he's going to save you out of America. By telling you to come out of her. That's how he's saving you. In Zechariah, the second chapter, it says, and deliver every man his soul. Flee. Free from Babylon and deliver your soul. So you're being saved by the Most High warning you before the decree. Read. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. See at that time we are accepted back with the Most High. So we needed a cleansing. We needed a sacrifice to save us because none of us in our flesh are worthy. None of us. So for those that are ex rejecting Christ, my question is, where's your sacrifice? Because if you're an Israelite, you, sh you, you know about sacrifices. It's written of in the book of Deuteronomy all the way through. In Leviticus, it tell you about which sacrifices to bring. So if you don't believe that Christ is your sacrifice or the Messiah is a sacrifice, why haven't you died yet? You should have died. Where's, where's your uh, sacrifice? Some of them will tell you, well, the Bible says we cannot do no sacrifice until we're in the land. Give me that scripture. You're living under the grace afforded to you by the Savior. You're living under the blood of Christ. Read. Verse 24. Verse 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. So they would rather believe that David would come back reincarnated than believe this is talking about Jesus Christ or Yeshua. And see, this is the mindset of the Pharisees when Christ was walking the earth. Well, are you David? The Sadducees who believe in reincarnation, are you David? They were waiting for David to come back and sit on his throne. So, I ask the brothers out there that don't believe in Christ or the sisters who just deal with the Old Testament. Well, do you believe that David is coming back to, to rule Israel? They'll, they'll say, well, yeah. Go to the book of Acts. Acts 2 and 29. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to show here is, if David would have, if David, if it, was, if it was meant for David to be king, the Most High would have gave him the kingdom back then, but it was too much blood on David's hands. It was too much blood on his hands, and he sinned. So the Most High put his kingdom into his son's hands, Solomon. So when it says, David shall be thy king in Ezekiel 37, you need to have the precepts to understand who is this it's speaking of. Is it talking about the physical David coming back in reincarnation, which some people teach? 
Let's see. Read Acts 2 and 29 through 31. Read it. Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you. Men and brethren, let me speak. Let, let me speak unto you. Go ahead. Of the patriarch David. Of the patriarch David. Read. That he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So he told them, listen, David is dead. And his sepulchre is with us till this day. This is what the disciples were telling the Pharisees. They're still waiting on David. David is dead. And if you want, we can show you where he's buried. That's what the disciples told these guys. Read. Verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that the Most High had sworn with an oath to him, to him that of the fruit of his loins. Of the fruit of his loins. That means out of his loins. Read. According to the flesh. According to the flesh. That means coming out of him. The issue out of him, which is sperma. Read. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He would raise up who? He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So that David in Ezekiel is speaking of the anointed Savior. Written of in Genesis 49 when you link up the precepts. A scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh comes. That David is talking about the position because David was the king in which Christ would come through. So the book of Ezekiel and the prophets all lead to Christ sitting on the throne. Now, I know some of you will not believe that because you'd rather believe that David will come back in reincarnation before you actually receive Christ. You have the right to. That's your belief. But let's see if you believe Isaiah's report. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Read. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1. Who have believed our report? Who have believed our report? So Isaiah knows that everyone will not believe his report. Now, mind you, we're talking about something like 600 years before Christ was born here. Probably about six, 700 years, about 700 years before Christ was born. Right here. Who have believed our report? No, excuse me, about a half a century. Excuse me, about 500 years. Excuse me. Before Christ was born. Isaiah was saying. Who will believe our report? Read. And to whom is the arm of the most high revealed? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To show you that this will not be revealed to everyone. So let's see this report. Read. Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground. So he's going to come out of a dry ground. He came out of a dry ground because the priesthood fell. Judah fell to, to Babylon. So now he must be this vine out of a dry ground. He must bring Israel back. Read. He have no form nor comeliness. He did not have any beauty about him. He wasn't what you would call a handsome man. Now this is the report Isaiah is given almost a half a century before Christ was born. To show you that he would he would be rejected. Read. And when ye shall and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Go ahead. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. He is what? He is despised and rejected of men. Men will reject him for no reason at all. Uh, that's why Isaiah is saying, who's going to believe the report? So I ask people, why do you reject him? Like, what did he do that you must reject him? So you don't believe the report in Isaiah. And that's another thing. You take them to Isaiah 53, they'll jump. Well, let's look at the 54th chapter. No, let's stay in the 53rd chapter. Who is this? Who is, who, who is Isaiah reporting on right here? Read. He is despised and rejected of men. Go ahead. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. Read. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And we hid, as it was, our faces from him. Read. 
He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was despised, but yet we didn't esteem him. Read. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs. So they claim that a man cannot die for a nation. A lot of these people that don't believe in the New Testament. He hath borne our griefs. Read. And carry our sorrows. And carry our sorrows. Now you know what they say? This scripture right here, this chapter is talking about a metaphor for the children of Israel. What? It says he. Okay? How can the Israelites carry other Israelites' sorrows? When you claim that one man can't do it. Read. Surely. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Go ahead. Yet we did esteem him stricken. We esteemed him stricken. He was beaten. Read. Smitten of the Most High. S smitten of the Most High. Read. And afflicted. And afflicted. Read. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our sins. I thought a man cannot be wounded or, or die for another person's sins. That's what they teach. Read. He was bruised for our iniquities. And he was bruised for our sin. Read. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Until Shiloh come, the peaceable one. So he was stricken so that the Most High can make peace with us. Why? In the law, it requires a lamb without blemish. So once a year to atone for our sins, Israel brought a lamb without blemish. So that our sins can be forgiven for that year. We needed a man who could come according to the law. To help them that were under the law. Make peace back with the most high. So he sent his son a spirit. In, from the heavens into the earth. That would walk perfectly. So that he can accept his people back to himself. Why? Because he made the law. The most high made the law and he's bound by his law. By his word. So in order for him to receive his people back. He needed to send a sacrifice within the earth. And those that accept that sacrifice. Is accepted with the father. It's just that simple. So if you don't believe this report. Where is your sacrifice? Where's your sacrifice? Read. And with his stripes we are healed. And with Christ's stripes we're healed. Go ahead. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. And we are like sheep and we went away from the Most High. Read. We have turned everyone to his own way. And we turn everyone to his own way. Go ahead. And the Most High have laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the Most High put on him the sin of us all. If it wasn't for him dying... He would kill us all off. If it wasn't for Christ's sacrifice. He wanted to do it. When Moses received the law. He wanted to do it at that time. He said Moses move out the way. I'll kill all of them. And I'll raise up children with you. I'll raise up a new nation. And Moses said Lord you can't. If you do this. The other nations around about. Going to look at us and say. You brought us out of Egypt. And save us with a mighty hand. To kill us. He wanted to do it before. And that's and those that believe in the Old Testament, you read that. And we're more evil as a people right now than we were back then. So if it wasn't for Christ's blood, we would all be exterminated right now. He gives us a chance. Okay? Read on. Verse 7. He was oppressed. He was what? He was oppressed. He was oppressed. Go ahead. And he was afflicted. He was afflicted. Go ahead. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. When you see these slaughterhouses, the lambs can't say nothing. They just wait for their turn. He didn't say anything because he knew this is what he had to take on himself. He knew going into Jerusalem that they would kill him. And he went. Read. 
and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he open, openeth not his mouth. Go ahead. Verse 8. Now, if this is not Christ, someone tell me who, who did this. Give me the history in the Old Testament in which someone exercised what we read in Isaiah 53. Read. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. He was taken from prison and judgment. Now, I know you can't figure it out because it's not there. But those that don't believe in the New Testament. But when you look in the New Testament, he was brought before Pontius Pilate. He was taken out of prison and beat. Then he was put before the people because Pontius Pilate wanted to wash his hands of the whole thing and say, listen, we have a custom once a year. We release one of you Jews once a year just for your customs. You can either take this man in which I find no fault with or you can take Barabbas. And Barabbas was a known evil guy riddled with spirits. Right? And the people said, give us Barabbas. That's our people. They was whipped up into a frenzy against the Savior. And you know what? The Savior didn't say nothing. Why? Because he knew he had to die to fulfill what was written in the Old Testament. He knew this. Read on. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? And who shall declare his generation? Go ahead. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was cut out of the land of the living. That means he died. He was killed at an early age. So if this is not Christ, someone tell me who is it? This is what Christ was teaching them when he was walking the earth. He was showing them, this is me. He was like, listen, this is me. I'm this guy. He was teaching them. He said, Peter, who am I? And Peter said, listen, you're definitely the son of the most high. He says, you know what, I'm going to build my church on you. Because no man revealed that to you but the Most High. The Most High sent forth the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit revealed that to you. Because you need the Holy Spirit to understand something spiritual. If someone have to beat Christ over your head to make you accept him, that means you don't know him. You haven't read about him. Read. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Why was he killed? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. These same people that claim Christ is not the Savior says that nowhere in the Bible does it say that a man can die for another man. And it's right there in Isaiah 53. So the question is, if this is, if this is he, written up in the Old Testament, why do you reject it? Read. Verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked. He made his grave with the wicked. He was actually crucified, Yeshua was, between two thieves. He made his grave with the wicked. Now, we mentioned when, what happened here in the stories. Someone tell me when did this happen in, in the Old Testament? What was his name? You'd rather believe nothing at all than believe that this is Christ. The Savior, the Messiah. And he's coming back. Read. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He did no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah says, whom shall believe my report? Now that's a real prophet. He prophesied Christ his whole existence and the purpose of Christ coming into the earth. Because without Christ, Israel is dead forever. So some people ask, well, what about the people that didn't walk with Christ? How can they make it into the kingdom? People were believing on Christ since Adam. Christ didn't just start in the New Testament. He was written up from Genesis all the way to Malachi. He was written. Okay? They just believed on him going forward. The same way in our he's in our absence as far as physically, but we believe in him 
going backwards. We don't see him, but we still believe on him. The same way they believed on him going forward. They were taught of him. Christ did not start from the time he came into the earth. Christ was from the beginning. He was from the beginning. Okay. Read on. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Most High. It to pleased the Most High to bruise him. Why? Through this chastisement, he will get his people back. He would accept his people because in the law, they needed a sacrifice. And none of us are good enough. None of them in the Old Testament was good enough. So being bound by his law, he had to send in a perfect sacrifice to adopt us back to the Father. It's that simple. It's in our law. The law of sacrifice. Read. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. His soul was a what? When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. His soul was an offering to the Most High for our sins. That's in the Old Testament. Now we're teaching the gospel. We're teaching the fact that Christ died on the cross without the New Testament. This is what the disciples was teaching out of. That because of this, the Most High took Christ's soul and made peace with us. This is what Peter was teaching. The disciples were teaching. This is what Paul was teaching. There was no such thing as a New Testament when the disciples were teaching. They was teaching this. Why? They knew that Israel was at, 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 had totally fallen from grace from the Most High. They knew that Israel was waiting on a Savior. The other nations were in power. So they needed him to come. They was looking for him. Those that believed on him. Follow me here. Read. Yet it pleased the Most High to, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. His soul is an offering for sin. And also I want to talk about the Christ says in Matthew 24. Many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. Anyone that comes saying they Christ or the Messiah. Don't believe them. Christ says if, the, if, if someone tell you that he's over here or over there. Don't believe him. And I'm saying this because one of Farrakhan's last speeches. He intimated or he went into uh, uh, trying to insinuate that he was the Messiah after Elijah Muhammad. That Elijah was the, the Elijah that would come in Malachi. And that he's the Messiah who Elijah led the way for. Okay. That, that's, that's blasphemy. He is not the Messiah. He's not worthy. None of us are worthy. It was Christ who came to lay down his blood to give us an opportunity. Okay? It was Yeshua who did this. And we don't give him his credit if we esteem ourselves as gods or someone greater than we are. All of us need Christ's blood. All of us are living under Christ's grace, including Farrakhan. All of us are living under his blood. Why? Because without that blood, we would all perish. Read. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Most High shall prosper in his hand. And the pleasure of the Most High shall prosper in his hand hand that's talking about our Messiah Yeshua and mind you I'm reading out of the Old Testament read verse 11 he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge and my righteous and my righteous servant go ahead justify many for he shall bear their iniquities he shall bear their iniquities he shall bear the sin of his people read verse 12 therefore will I divide him with a portion divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death 
and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. Those are the two thieves he was, he was hung between. Read. And he bared the sin of many. And he bared the sin of many. Read. And made intercession for the transgressors. And he made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for us. Now, what have we read in this report that would make us reject Christ? What that is, let me get that real quick. Pass me that. That's good. That's good. Excuse me then. That's good. What have we read in the Old Testament in Isaiah that would make us reject this report? Read. I'll sit on that. Okay. I need you to get Luke the fourth chapter. Luke 4. You there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Start at the 16th verse. St. Luke, chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, read. And stood up for to read. So when did Christ go into the synagogue? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So this is the day that the Jews or the Israelites go to worship. Sabbath day. Read. And stood up for to read. So he stood up for to read. Like on the Sabbath, every man, every man child is supposed to come up and read 12, 12 age or over out of the law. They do that, believe it or not, in the Jewish synagogues today at the age of 12. Read. Verse 17, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. So they brought to Christ's table the book of Isaiah. See, back then the Bible was not compiled. Each book had, had its own scroll. Read. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Most High is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel this to is, the poor. This is what Christ is speaking. Read. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He hath sent me the, to, to, to heal the brokenhearted. Read. To preach deliverance to the captives. To, to preach deliverance to the heart, to the what? To preach deliverance to the captives. To preach deliverance to those who are captives. These were the Israelites living under Roman rule. Read. And recovering of sight to the blind. And to let us see again, because we were in darkness. Read. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Go ahead. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Read. Verse 20. And he closed the book. And after he read that one, those few verses, excuse me, he closed the book of Isaiah. Go ahead. And he gave it to the minister. Then he gave it to the guy that gave it to him. Read. And sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Everyone looked at him at, one, at once. Go. Verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. He told them right there, I'm the one. This day, that this scripture is fulfilled in your sight. I'm the one. He proclaimed himself. So that's when Christ first received his mission to go out to the people. That was right after his temptation. He went straight into the synagogue on the Sabbath and told them, it's time. I'm here. Everyone heard it at one time. Now, can you imagine the look on the faces of, of, of the, the magistrates and the ministers and the, the high priests and all the people in there? Who've been looking for this savior for the longest and he comes in and tell them listen I'm the one and then after that start doing all these great miracles and people started following him right after this now for those who don't believe that he's the one I'm talking about you that don't believe in the New Testament let's go to Isaiah 61 
to show you what he was reading. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. Read it. The spirit of the most high is upon me. The spirit of the most high is upon Yeshua. Read. Because the most high have anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Same thing he read. Read. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Same thing Christ read. Read. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Go ahead. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Most High. Go ahead. And the day of vengeance of our, of our power. And the day of vengeance of our God. Because in Genesis 49 it tells you that at the end of the day. He will actually take down the Idumeans. Who was ruling when Christ was on the earth? The Roman Empire. The Romans. That's the reason Herod the Great. Who was sanctioned and set up by the Romans. Wanted him dead they knew the prophecies they knew that eventually he would come to take them down but what they didn't know it wasn't for that time it was for a future time but they tried to kill the child before he got sacrificed for his nation they wanted to kill the child so the disciples and some others started cleaving the Christ because they was tired of the Romans and they wanted Christ to release them out of their captivity. They knew that it was wrong what the Romans were doing to the Israelites. They knew it. So they was cleaving to Christ for protection. And they say, if he's the one, he will save us. But they didn't know that Christ at that time came strictly to fulfill the sacrificial part of his coming. Okay. Then he would come again to fulfill taking down the Idumeans and treading them in the wine press and establishing Israel again as a nation. Read. To comfort all that mourn. To comfort all that mourn. Read. Verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Most High, that he might be glorified. That the Most High might be glorified. And this is what Christ read, or Yeshua read, in Luke the fourth chapter. Fulfilling this scripture, he said, this day, this is fulfilled in your sight. But did they embrace him after he read this? No, they, they were thinking about killing him. Zechariah the ninth chapter. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Read it. We're almost finished here. Isaiah. Chapter 9, verse 6. Go ahead. For unto us a child is born. T unto us a child is born. So those who don't believe in the New Testament, who is this child it's talking about? Read. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Read. And his name shall be called Wonderful. So these are all the things he's called in the earth. Wonderful. Counselor. Counselor. The mighty God. The mighty power, which means Allah Hayyam. He was there in the beginning. Let us make man in his image. Read. The everlasting Father. The everlasting Father, because he said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He's operating uh, for his Father. Read. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace, which is Shiloh. So if this is not Christ, I need someone that's reading the Old Testament and believe in the Old Testament to tell me who is this guy right here in Isaiah the ninth chapter. What will he bring? Read. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David. Upon the throne of David, which means he will sit on the throne of David. So if you see a scripture which says that David shall be our king, this is fulfilling that. He's sitting in David's stead. Read. 
and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with a judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Most High of hosts will perform this. Read. The Most High have sent a word unto Jacob. He sent the word unto who? The Most High have sent a word unto, unto Jacob. Read. And it have lighted upon Israel. And it have lighted upon Israel. Read. Verse 9. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim, and the inhabitant of Samaria. Ephraim was is the so-called Puerto Ricans. They were the actual kings over the northern kingdom before they were taken out in 721 BC. Read. That say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Read. Verse 11. Therefore, the Most High shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and, sh and join his enemies together. So it lets you know that he's going to take down the adversaries. Now, when Christ was on the earth, you had some rebels who wanted to join Christ because they figured it was time to receive the kingdom. But it wasn't time yet. Christ at that time was only the sacrifice. But he's coming back. Let's go to Malachi. Get Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 before we go to Malachi. And I'm all in the Old Testament here. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Read it. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Most High, that I will raise unto, unto David a righteous branch. A righteous branch. That means out of David will come a branch. Read and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. See that? So he came to give Israel safety. Right now, there's no safety for Israel right now. They're planning mass genocide against Israel. Okay? Uh, under the cloak of the New World Order, or the cloak of security when they says when they shall say peace and safety when really they know they're aiming this global destruction towards God's people they know this and they try to do it before the second coming of Christ read and and this is his name whereby he shall be called go ahead the Lord our righteousness the Lord our righteousness okay he's our righteousness what is the righteousness? The righteousness is the law. That's what Christ is. He's the law made flesh. The Lord our righteousness. Now, if this is not Christ, I need someone out there who don't believe in the New, in the New Testament to tell me who is this. Let's go to... Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 9 and 10. Luke... 11 and 20. Deuteronomy 9 and 10. Luke 11 and 20. Read. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 10. And the Most High delivered unto me two, table, two tables of stone written with the finger of the Most High. Written with what? Written with the finger of the Most High. Now, the commandments was actually written with the fingers of the Most High. Okay. So, but when you look at that word God that you would see it says the finger of God. In Genesis 1 and 26 it says let us make man in our image. God is not a singular it's a plural. Allahayim which means Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So let's see who gave Moses the commandments. Let's go to Luke 11 and 20. Luke chapter 11 verse 20 read but if I with the finger of the most high cast out devils he says but if I with the what with the finger of the most high cast out devils no doubt the kingdom of the most high is come upon you so the most high used Yeshia he used Yeshia in the Old Testament to bring forth the commandments and he used that same power from the fingers of the Most High to cast out spirits. 
See, they couldn't deal with this guy. They couldn't show any blame on him, so they had to lie on him. If you can't attack the doctrine, then you must start attacking the person when you can't stand with the doctrine. So that, those are the things that was happening during Christ's time. Now, I can go on and on and on and on. There's many scriptures that I have here that I can speak about, but I'm, I wanted to show you, brothers and sisters, that Christ is written of throughout the whole Bible. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Like it says in Revelations 1. He's the beginning. He was here in the beginning as a spirit that helped create things. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to open this up for questions. One moment. But before I open this up for questions, I would appreciate if... if, if oh, hold on one second here. <clears throat> 